One of the most famous examples of a financial bubble is tulip mania. It happened in the Netherlands almost 400 years ago. The Dutch made use of something called futures contracts, which was a contract to buy something in the future. In order to secure a good price for their harvest, farmers would often sell a futures contract for it. Essentially, a buyer would commit to purchase the crops at an agreed upon price in the future. That buyer could also sell their rights to make that purchase. If they signed a deal to buy tulips, for example, at 100 florins, but the going price of tulips rises to 200 florins, they could sell their contract to someone else for something in between, letting them cash in now while the new buyer is now able to buy the tulips at a nice low price. Well, in November of 1636, the futures price of a somewhat rare and prized tulip called the Viceroy skyrocketed to over 2,500 florins for a single flower. Comparisons between this much time and space are hard, but that translates to something like $37,000 per flower. The skyrocketing prices were seen as a great investment to many and the rush to strike it rich on tulips overwhelmed just about everyone. The painting shown here was painted just a few years later, depicting the traders as monkeys caught in a frenzy. It is said that a sailor in his infinite stupidity mistook one of the flowers for an onion, picked it up and ate it, and he was jailed. But the frantic buying up of these tulip futures kept driving the price higher. And to be clear, people weren't buying tulips, they were buying the right to buy tulips later. Then on February 5th, 1637, the party ended and in a blink of an eye, the bubble burst and prices fell to a couple florins. This burst ruined many and it is said to have caused a recession for the Dutch, though these claims are disputed. Some believe there was a change to the way futures contracts worked for tulips, whereby the buyers could opt out of the contract for a small fee, meaning there wasn't much risk in making the agreement. But those who bought high, who bought high ended up losing everything they invested. Bubbles like this have long captured people's attention and filled their dreams with what ifs. But the real thing I want you to notice is that you can probably think of a few events like this, but they're all modern. The dot-com bubble, the housing bubble, Bitcoin, these sort of things used to be rare, but now they happen all the time. Financial bubbles like this are not entirely irrational. It may be crazy to pay $37,000 for a flower, but it might still be rational and profitable so long as there's someone else dumb enough to pay more. This is called the greater fool theory. So long as there's a greater fool than me, I might make some money on this thing, even though I don't really believe it's worth so much. Almost a century later, another famous bubble erupted in Britain on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. The South Sea Company was founded in 1711 as a private-public partnership to consolidate debt held by the British government. In return for creating a financially beneficial situation for the British government, the company was granted a monopoly on all trade with South America. It was a pretty lucrative deal and was working extremely well for the East India Company that controlled British trade with India. Except at the time, Britain was at war with Spain and Spain controlled South America, making trade impossible. But the South Sea Company was helmed by a guy named Robert Harley, who happened to also be essentially the Minister of Finance for Britain and a powerful politician. He steered Britain to a peace agreement with Spain, which opened up some avenues for profit for the company, most especially and unfortunately in the slave trade. At this point, stock in the company was offered to the general public, though you couldn't buy it outright the way you would buy stock in a company today. Essentially, what you had to do was buy government bonds, and then you could exchange them for shares in the South Sea Company. Things were slow going at first, but by 1717, things were looking up for trade in South America. Enter John Blunt, 
a charming man who worked for a young company called the Sword Blade Company. The company started out making French-style swords, but acting on the company's behalf, Blunt persuaded Robert Harley to reintroduce lotteries to fund the government. Blunt and the Sword Blade Company ran the lotteries and earned fees for doing so. Over the years, the Sword Blade Company began operating essentially as a bank, taking in deposits and making loans. When the South Sea Company was created, Blunt was essentially on their board of directors. By 1718, Blunt was the most influential voice on the board, and he had the South Sea Company issue new shares at a higher price to the public, meaning you needed to buy more government bonds to trade for each share. He convinced the company to issue enough shares that the company would consolidate all of the debt owned by the British government, including the debt held by the Bank of England, which was then a private company. It was a transparent attempt to diminish the power and influence of the Bank of England, which would favor his own sword blade company. The South Sea Company and the Bank of England got into a bidding war for that government debt, but the South Sea Company won by bribing members of Parliament to allow him to sell shares of the South Sea Company for cash, not just in exchange for government debt, which had been illegal before, but now made shares in the South Sea Company the hottest commodity in town. In 1720, Blunt issued tons of new shares, which sold in just hours to the general public, who believed the company would hold vast influence on trade and the government. The share price, which had been £120 in January, was up to £750 in June. So, Blunt offered new shares for £1,000, and people took the bait. But at the end of the day, the South Sea Company was still making very little profit compared to other companies. And when there was no one left to buy shares, the only thing left for people to do was sell them. Something new at the time, which is extremely common today, was buying on margin. Buying on margin means the investor borrowed money in order to buy some asset, which they hoped to sell later for more than the repayment on the loan. These days, usually a person will open a margin account, which allows them to borrow money from their broker or the company which gave them the account. That person is then able to buy stocks and other financial assets with the borrowed money. The gamble is that the price of those assets will rise and they will be able to sell them, pay back the loan, and still have a tidy profit left over. These days, trillions of dollars are borrowed every year for that purpose. But in the 1720s, it was a new concept. A lot of people borrowed money to buy shares in the South Sea Company, certain that the share price would keep rising and they would be made rich without ever putting a dime of their own money in. But when there wasn't any more credit to fuel the buying, the price stopped rising and it soon came time for the borrowers to pay back their lenders meaning they had to sell what they had at a loss. When lots of people are in that situation, a small drop in the price can set off a cascade of selling as panic sets in and these investors try to jump off the seeking, sinking ship before their losses get too big. There are five phases of a financial bubble. First comes displacement, where there's an initial increase in the value of an asset as investors become enamored with a new opportunity. Prices rise slowly at first, but as word spreads of the initial success, there's a boom as people jump in with the hopes of making a quick profit. But the leap in the price is like a drug that intoxicates investors, putting them in a state of irrational exuberance where they believe the prices will just keep on rising, making them even richer. But when the price fails to rise anymore, some people decide it's time to take those short-term profits and sell what they have. Those who think better safe than sorry push the price down with their sales, and that sets off a chain reaction among the investors who have taken on too much risk in the hopes of continually rising prices. As they panic and sell, prices plummet and the bubble pops. 
Throughout most of human history, this was a problem for rich people. They were the only ones with money sitting around and too much time on their hands. Bubbles like these would make some people a fortune at the expense of some other rich person, but rarely did the fallout extend to ordinary people who weren't involved in the mess. But then the Industrial Revolution happened, and we all became rich people with extra money to throw at these silly whims. And our growing economies elevated the importance of banks as institutions which would facilitate investment in new capital. But those banks are run by people too, people who sometimes make judgments as bad as these.